Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Answer Everywhere. This is an improvised live show where every uh, weekday we jump into a code repository that uh, I haven't seen before or that I'm not familiar with and poke around and try to see what we can find. Sort of like archaeology, but with code and less sand. Today, there's a special bonus episode to look at Twitter's recommendation algorithm. This was released, uh, I think, on Friday, uh, or at least that, that's what it says here. Um, and so I thought it would be good to, to take a look at uh, what was released and see what we can find, see if there's anything interesting in there. So uh, normally, I don't spend much time reading documentation. I just jump, jump straight into the code. Uh, but today, since this is something of uh, you know importance uh, to to people outside of just um, source code nerds, I thought I would at least read the blog post and um, and take a look at the README and see if anything else uh, that they've distributed is, is uh, worth our attention. Um, I should also say before I begin, as a sort of caveat, that I um, I'm not a machine learning uh, guy. I'm not certainly not a machine learning expert. And I ha again, I haven't looked at this repo before. So this is not uh, an expert uh, walking through what the recommendation algorithm does. That being said, I have some uh, small background in, in um, machine learning. So there shouldn't be anything that's too um, completely out of, uh, out of left field. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, and then maybe before we begin, let's say a little bit about what we expect the recommend recommendation algorithm code to do and what we don't expect it to do. So um, my understanding based on the, the reporting I've seen around this is that this algorithm is the, the recommendations um, that Twitter uses to, to populate the custom timeline. So when you log into Twitter, um, Twitter is going to show you a bunch of tweets and those, the, the, the decision about whether to show you those tweets and the order in which those tweets are shown are going to be computed in some sense by this code. So that's the sort of thing we, we expect. Um, from a technical point of view, that kind of algorithm um, is, is very common. There's not, um, uh, th these sorts of algorithms show up all over the place. I guess one thing that makes the Twitter algorithm more interesting is we expect it to be able to handle a large scale because Twitter is a, is a gigantic, uh, deals with a gigantic amount of data. And we expect it to have maybe more um, social import, social influence than other smaller uh, recommendation algorithms would have. Um, uh, and uh, this sort of algorithm in general, um, you, you might think of as a, as a, as a particular interest of a, of a common information retrieval problem. Um, and so just based on, on those sorts of first principles, we can have a sense of what we expect it to do. We expect to start with some sort of population of tweets, kind of candidate tweets, um, probably tweets that are um, easy to access and easy to serve, like things that, that, that were tweeted recently and may, might be in memory or in cache um, and where, whatever Twitter servers are. Um, at some point, it's going to filter out uh, things that have been uh, essentially uh, blacklisted or forbidden. So things like uh, uh, tweets from, from people or, or maybe topics that you've blocked or tweets that are, um, you know, violate the law, that sort of thing. And then with what's remaining after that kind of filtering, they're going to possibly apply some system of boosts and anti-boosts, whatever an anti-boost is called. So, um, you know, if, if the answer everywhere tweet starts out at, at priority, uh, let's say a hundred, um, and you are super into my content, it might boost, uh, my tweets up 20 points. And then there might be another one, another, you know, thingy that comes along and, and, you know, decrements, um, that particular tweet for me because it mentions the word potato and you hate potatoes. So th that sort of thing. Um, so it may be it uh, it may be architected to have that kind of uh, boost and then anti-boost thing where we have a bunch of um, operations and then we sort them and apply them, or it may be just kind of some giant uh, function that uh, ingests a bunch of tweets and outputs a ranking 
um, without kind of having that sort of scheduling flavor that you might have in a traditional um, in a traditional information retrieving uh, pipeline. So that's kind of what we expect. We'll take a look at their blog, and then we'll pop into the code and and see what we find. So here's the blog. Um, this seems to be so it's an engineering blog, so it's more or less targeted toward um, engineers, but it's also we're not. I'm not expecting it to be super technical. Um, but it says the recommendation pipeline is made up of three main stages that consume these features. What are features? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. So, okay, how do we choose tweet tweets? The models aim to answer important questions about the Twitter network, such as what is the probability you will interact with another user in the future, or what are the communities on Twitter and what are trending tweets within them? Answering these questions accurately enables Twitter to, to deliver the most relevant recommendations. So maybe it's worth pointing out that um, the relevance here is, is a bit of a euphemism. So, you know, uh, traditionally information retrieval, um, you presumably got started back uh, in things like uh, search systems for, for university libraries. You would type in, you know, you're interested in um, the history of fashion in, in Italy or whatever, and you type in history, fashion, Italy, and it's going to return a list of, of relevant books. So it's going to take whatever you're, you're looking for and try to return something that, that kind of matches your intent um, in some way. So, so that's, that's like the ordinary meaning of relevance. It's like relevant to my goals relevant to the things that I want to do, et cetera. Um, in the context of an algorithm like this, um, relevant has a, has a different meaning. And the, and the operational definition of relevant is more or less like whether Twitter thinks it's going to keep you on the site and have you interact with um, like advertisements or whatever. So relevant is, uh, you know, in this context, it's more, it's less about what the, the user wants and more about like what Twitter wants from the user. And maybe that's um, not going to be necessary distinction to keep in mind as we look through this, but it may also be necessary because um, we're going to have to kind of make that translation as we're looking through things, um, uh, because the the ultimate goal here is the whatever the Twitter's business case is. So I don't think we have the data, for example, that that the algorithm is trained on, um, and we don't have um, you know. We don't necessarily know what metrics the algorithm is meant to optimize, but typically in any sort of business like this, um, you would have some business relevant metrics. Like I think uh, if you if you look at some of Twitter's investor relations stuff, uh, they use like monetized user hours or like monetized login, monetizable like login users or whatever. Um, users that are like logged in that Twitter knows about and it knows how to monetize you. So that's those are the sorts of metrics that, that Twitter reports to it, its investors. And presumably, um, if whatever the recommendation algorithm is doing is not uh, increasing those numbers, then Twitter's going to tweak the algorithm. So that's in some sense outside of the algorithm itself. But um, that's kind of what the goal that the algorithm is, is trying to achieve. So um, so that that's relevance. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is at least my mental model of what machine learning is up to in general is you're basically estimating some sort of some sort of function. So as I'm going through the, through this, um, I'm going to be thinking in terms of like what function um, are they are they estimating, and kind of how are they estimating it? Are they uh, estimating like a linearization of the function, like some sort of giant matrix? What are the inputs? Or the inputs uh, presumably will be things like uh, your interests, um, whatever it's the needs of its advertisers are that day or that week, um, maybe the needs of its popular users. And whatever the function that they're estimating is, it's going to take those inputs and presumably output something uh, like a list of tweets, like an ordered list of tweets. Um, and that's the thing that, that ultimately is going to be shown to you. And then maybe in those tweets, they're going to feed in other things like um, advertisements or pictures of cats or, or whatever they do. Um, I also have chat open. Uh, let me take a, I'm getting some chats. Let me try pinning, uh, putting chat over here. Um, is this going to be available on the channel after live? Yep. Um, I post like higher, I guess you might call them VODs. Uh, uh, basically, whatever is live, I post a higher resolution version um, I'm, I have a backlog of several, so it might be a, a day or two 
Um, but it will be up. And then Joshua says, I was texting my buddies saying I needed someone much smarter than me to do a breakdown of your life story. Well, um, thanks, Josh, or, or Joshua. Um, I'm not going to promise that I'm smarter than you, and I definitely am not going to promise that I know what I'm doing. But I'm at least, you know, curious, and I've looked at other things where I didn't know what I was doing. So uh, <laughs> so maybe this will be, this will be of, of, of use to somebody. Um, okay, and so and so, what does Twitter say that their that their recommendation pipeline is doing? Hey, whoa now. Let me get that uh, that window back. Okay. All right. So so Twitter says um, the pipeline has three uh, stages. They're going to fetch the best tweets from different recommendation sources in a process called candidate sourcing. Now, I don't know if we get the different recommendation sources as part of this release, um, but maybe we do. Um, and I don't know what different recommendation sources is, but you could imagine things like, um, you know, one recommendation source might be like, here's a list of junk that's fastest to serve because you're in um, Virginia and we're next to the Virginia data center. And these are, you know, like tweets that might be relevant to you that are that are easy to access by network distance or whatever. And then some recommendation things will be like, you know, uh, somebody, there's like a Super Bowl ad campaign. And so maybe that's one recommendation source. So it might be different things like that. And then it's going to rank each tweet using a machine lear using a machine learning model. And that's going to be probably the bulk of, of what people are interested in with this release. And then they're going to apply heuristics and filters, such as filtering out tweets from users you've blocked not safe for work content and tweets you've already seen. So this is maybe the reverse uh, way that I that I described it and it, initially. Um, so um, so blocking and stuff it looks like is going to happen after you ranked all the tweets. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right way to do it. Presumably there's a re there re there's a reason to do that. You I guess here we're expanding energy, possibly ranking tweets that has like not safe for work content or that we've blocked. Um, but if the, if the ranking is, um, uh, user independent, then maybe that, maybe that's fine because maybe some users, you know, some, not all users block the same stuff. Maybe some users allow not safe for work content. Um, honestly, I don't really use Twitter, so I don't know, um, what their policy on that is. And, um, certainly if the ranking is user independent, then it won't know what you've already seen. So, um, and there may be some sort of filter before step two that filters out things that are inappropriate for any user at all. I don't know. Um, then it says the service that's responsible for constructing and serving the for you timeline. I guess for you timeline is like the, the marketing term for this, for this timeline that, that's populated by this algorithm is called home mixer. Okay. Maybe, maybe Twitter like home screen or whatever. Home mixer is built on product mixer, our custom Scala framework. Uh, so we may, <laughs> this may all be in Scala, I guess. Um, we'll see. Um, that facilitates building feeds of content. This service acts as the software backbone that connects different candidate sources, scoring functions, heuristics, and filters. Okay. Um, and then we have this diagram below, which is too small, I think, for us to, to see, but maybe we can zoom in. Okay, so we've got data's features and home mixer. Um, data is the follow graph, maybe like I follow... Uh, you and you follow uh, whoever, who's it? <laughs> some, some celebrity, uh, Taylor Swift, um, or whatever. And then um, that that's one of the inputs, I guess. So, you know, uh, hopefully I should see tweets from people I follow. Um, but my, I might also see tweets that are like friends of friends because Twitter thinks that I might like them as well. Um, tweet engagement. This is one of those business metric things. So like, you know, um, businesses like to see like tweets being liked or retweeted, uh, that shows interest and that I guess increases ad revenue somehow indirectly. Um, so that's going to be one of the inputs into the model and then user data, whatever user data is, I don't know, maybe that includes things like preferences. Like I, uh, you know, I like football and I don't like cars or horses or whatever. Um, and then, uh, oh, I zoomed in extra. Okay. So, and then features. So somehow we've got this data, this is going to be some sort of input. Um, this doesn't seem like it's flowing in, but maybe it's like one input into this thing. 
but the features are sim clusters. Who knows what sim clusters are, but maybe some sort of cl uh, cluster by similar um, similarity. TWHIN, I think I have no hope of figuring out what that's supposed to be. Um, real graph seems like a marketing term for whatever, some, some sort of graph. And then trust and safety, I'm going to go ahead and guess is, is things like not safe for work or like abuse images um, or, you know, really bad words or whatever. Um, and so this is another thing, I guess data is input into features, but at least in this diagram, uh, data itself is not a direct input into Home Mixer. Um, but at any rate, Home Mixer has a candidate source, which is, uh, I think I mentioned some sort of pool of candidate tweets. And this includes things like in-network, presumably uh, maybe in the follow network. Uh, but we'll we'll try to, you know, I'll try to guess what these things mean and we'll try to redeem those guesses and um, see whether I'm right or wrong uh, by looking at the blog post and looking at the uh, and looking at the code. Um, the, whatever the real graph is, TNS, terms, no, trust and safety, not terms and services. Um, embedding space, presumably some um, machine learning embedding, which uh, we'll talk about, you know, if, if it comes up. Um, whatever sim clusters in TWHIN are, and the social graph. I'm not sure how social graph is different from follow graph and follow graph engagements. I'm not sure how that's different from follow graph combined with tweet engagement, but these sorts of things are input into the heavy ranker, which based on this diagram, seems like they're trying to evoke something like a, um, a neural network, maybe a recurrent neural network, a, um, ne a neural network. Um, and then after the ranker, uh, we're going to go to heuristics and filtering, which has things like social proof. Um, I think in psychology, social proof is things like, you know, if I roll into the bar, um, like 16 dudes deep and they're all like dressed awesomely, then you might assume that like, I, <laughs> I'm cool <laughs> and, and talk to me more. So, so maybe social proof, um, means like, you know, things that your friends engage, engage with or that, or that other people engagement, uh, engage with, um, that's like a signal that those might be interesting things. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna guess that that's, that's what that means. Visibility uh, for, with respect to trust and safety. So I guess this is where the blocking happens. Author diversity. We'll come back to author diversity. That could be a couple of things. Um, content balance. That could also be... <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, and feedback fatigue, which who knows. Um, but then, it's, so, so those things all go in, in, into mixing together with ads and who to follow. I don't know where who to follow comes from. This seems like a um, this seems like a big gap. Like, uh, you know, how are they deciding who to follow? Is that something people pay for? Is that is that like not depending on the same stuff like social proof? But somehow, um, I guess it's going to make it, something is going to make a determination about who it thinks you should follow. And um, they their incentive is to recommend things that you want to follow, because if they keep recommending things that you don't follow, it's going to be annoying to you, and they're going to be wasting compute power. So um, somehow they determine that. But at least in this diagram, it doesn't seem to be part of the same um, uh, machine learning pipeline, although it might use some of the same, you know, this pipeline might log some stuff and then those logs might be scraped later and, and figured, you know, and some who to follow thing is, is, is figured out, who knows. Um, and then from mixing, we also, from mixing the output is the timeline. Now, um, feedback fatigue, coming back to these things that I said I would, I would talk about later. Um, so feedback fatigue, I don't have a good intuition about what that might be, but author diversity is presumably, um, um, Includes things like diversity in the obvious sense, like, you you know, maybe you'll get, um, b you know, both men and women in your feed. Um, maybe you'll get racial diversity, but it might also be things like the, like um, viewpoint diversity is one thing that, that, that people talk about. And then content balance kind of sounds like um, a sort of euphemism that um, like news, uh, news agencies talk about in the United States, which means like... Um, we'll try to um, kind of divide things. You know, if we're gonna report the news, we're gonna report like the the Republican and the Democrat positions on the news, like regardless of whether those are 
um, both coherent positions. Like, um, and so it seems like author diversity and content balance might include things like, um, might include things like boosting, um, people that you disagree with, um, or, or otherwise just boosting like people who are, um, trying to, to mix things up like in, in, uh, in some sense. So I don't know, maybe the blog will talk about those things. Maybe these, those will be left as, um, just general terms and they, and they would tell us, I'm curious what feedback fatigue is. I guess it's, it's fatigue sounds like they want to make sure that whatever they're recommending is not making you mad and making you go away. So if you leave the site, like if it, if it shows you, you know, if Twitter decides I like cats and it keeps showing me cats. Um, and then every time I see a cat, I log out of Twitter. Presumably it has some way of saying, okay, we should stop showing this guy cats. So maybe that's the sort of thing that feedback fatigue is. Um, so, so we'll take a look at their blog and, and see what else they say about that. All right, let's explore the key parts of the system, roughly in the order that they'd be called during a single timeline request, starting with retrieving candidates from the candidate source. So what is the candidate source? Um, for each request, we attempt to extract the bat, the extract the best 1500 tweets from a pool of hundreds of millions. That's a small number from a large pool. So what are, what are the options? The other, the options are either to iterate over hundreds of millions of tweets for each request, which sounds infeasible. So however they do this, th this is some sort of, uh, presumably heavily heuristic, mm. or, um, or they're like doing a bunch of pre computation so that on each request, um, the actual computation is much less than just selecting stuff from hundreds of millions. Um, and they find candidates from people you know. So, okay, so people you know in network and from people you don't know out of network. And today, the timeline is, is roughly 50% in network and 50% out of network. It says consists of 50% in network and out of network. Um, I'm going to say roughly because I don't know how they would, uh, you know, maybe they, maybe they do that exactly. Oh, on average. Okay. <laughs> this may vary from you. Yeah. So, so personally, um, I've, I've tried to use Twitter a couple of times. I almost never want to see out of network. So hopefully for me, it would show me more in network, but, um, if they don't show you any out of network, then they're not going to, you know, it's going to be harder for people to grow, uh, who are trying to get followers. So they have to balance the, the interests of, of, of those people and of the advertisers with the interests of the, of the users who are consuming tweets. Um, so in network source is the largest candidate source. Okay. So it's the largest source, I guess. Uh-huh. And aims to deliver the most relevant recent tweets from users you follow. So I guess by implication, um, if a tweet's not recent, it won't show up necessarily. That's to be expected. But also if, it, if, if, if Twitter doesn't think it's relevant, it might not show up. So if I'm following my Nana, um, I might miss updates from her uh, because Twitter doesn't think they're relevant to, to me or to my interest or whatever. Um, and it efficiently ranks tweets of those you follow. I don't know what efficiently means. It might mean like heuristically, um, based on their relevance using a logistic regression model. The top tweets are then sent to the next stage. So logistic regression is like a, um, it's typically used as a way of doing, uh, like linear regression on, um, on binomial data. So usually you would have like, you'd be predicting like a, a string of ones and zeros based, um, I think typically based on continuous data. So, um, I'm not sure how you get a ranking. So just for the sake of, um, uh, just double checking that I know what I'm talking about. So here's our logistic regression. We get this S curve as the common logistic regression thing. And, uh, it seems like the data we're modeling is either one or zero ones on top, zero on the bottom. Uh, so yeah, it's got this log odds to be a linear combination of one or more independent variables. Okay. Do we get an equation? So, okay. So we get this logistic function or use a location parameter, essentially the mean. Um, I thought this was for a binomial variable. 
Okay, so two categories, binomial logistic regression, the categories are indexed by one, zero, and one. And then what is the other case? Oh, okay, so we get maybe multi -lo multinomial re logistic regression. The, the dependent variable in question is nominal or equivalently categorical, meaning that it falls into one of a set of categories that cannot be ordered in any meaningful way. Okay, so for example, which major will a college choose? What blood type does a person have? But this is still mul uh, multinomial and not like a rank, right? Let's see if we can find uh, the word rank. Okay. That's what it says, right? It efficiently ranks. The top tweets are then sent to the next stage. So maybe it's just depicting, um, top, I mean, maybe they're treating the multinomial categories as like zero, one, two, three, and, and it's considering those to be like ranked in ranked order. But just for the sake of completeness, I have ChatGPT and Bard open. I don't think I've used Bard ever before, so I'll ask Bard first, just for fun. Um, so can you logistic? Can you use logistic regression to uh, to rank things? And oh. Okay, yes, logistic re regression can be used to rank things. In fact, it's a popular method for ranking items in a variety of applications, such as product recommendation systems, search engines, and spam filters. Okay? In the context of ranking, the event that is being predicted is whether or not an item is relevant to a user. Okay, so that's like a, that seems binomial. Logistic regression models are built using a set of training data. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. The use of this training data to learn a set of rules that can be used to predict the relevance of new items. It can be used to rank new items. The item model is first used to predict the probability of each item being relevant. The items are then ranked in order of their predicted probability, with the items that are most likely to be relevant being ranked first. Okay, so I guess um, we're predicting a one or zero variable, um, but the, of course the logistic function is giving us like a... a um, an estimated probability is estimating some some statistical parameter and we're just the, the ranking is being done by just the things at the highest estimated parameter i guess are, are considered higher than the others in the ranking system all right what else um, and then we've got out of uh, all right is there anything else to, to see here in, in in network okay oh the most important the most important component of in uh, in ranking in network tweets is real graph Real graph is a model which predicts the likelihood of engagement between two users. Okay, so this is depicting whether two users will, will interact. The higher the real graph score between you and the author of the tweet, the more of their tweets will include. So this is basically clickbait, right? So uh, real graph is somehow going to estimate whether you're going to click on things, <laughs> and um, and if it thinks that if it thinks that the clickbait is your score is high enough, it's going to send it to you. Um, so here's a paper. I'm not going to read this paper live, <laughs> um, but I will bookmark it and take a look at it later. Okay. Uh, actually, let's do, do, do okay. Let's see if there's any graphs. Uh, growth generation follow graph plus address book plus interaction data union decay. We get real graph edges. I'm not sure what union decay is, but um, maybe this is, gives some graph, and maybe they're going to prune edges or decay edges in, in some way. Um, and then that, that's how we get the real graph edges. And then we use feature generation and model learning to kind of take log data, maybe like things like click logs and whatever. We'll train it using logistic regression model and uh, score. Maybe score includes things like ranking, like we talked about. And this is going to give us weighted edges. So this, I assume the weight is essentially the likelihood that you're going to interact, or that the two, the, you know, the two nodes are going to interact. And then the, these give you the personalized page rank, recommendation, real-time search, and type ahead. Maybe type ahead is when you're typing something else and it try, try, typing something out and it tries to complete it for you. And then we get a cosine similarity thing for collaborative filtering and ads targeting. Okay, it seems more or less consistent with you know at at that level of hand waviness it seems more or less consistent with what we're seeing here in the blog post as well the in-network source has been the subject of recent work at twitter we recently stopped using fan out service a 12 year old service that, that was previously used to provide in-network tweets from a cache of tweets from each user uh we're also in the process of redesigning the logistic regression ranking model which was last updated and trained several years ago exclamation mark 
this is kind of like an apology. <laughs> this is this is basically saying like, um, you know, we know we've got work to do or whatever. Um, so out of network sources, uh, let's see, we've got um, finding relevant tweets outside of a user's network is a trickier problem. How can we tell if a certain tweet will be relevant to you if you don't follow the author? Twitter takes two approaches. Okay, social graph. The first approach is to estimate uh, what you would find relevant um, uh, by analyzing the engagements of people you follow or those with similar interests. So it's going to find similar people and people you follow. That's going to create some pool of people. And among those people, I guess it's going to figure out who those people like. So we traverse the graph of engagements and follows to answer the following questions. What tweets did the people I follow recently engage with? And who likes similar tweets to me? And what else have they recently liked? Okay, so it's gonna generate candidate tweets using this information. Um, uh, graph traversals of this type are essential for our out-of-network recommendation. We developed GraphJet, a graph processing engine that maintains real-time interaction graph, a real-time interaction graph between users and tweets to execute these traversals. While such heuristics for searching the Twitter engagement and follow network have been proven useful, uh, these currently serve about 15% of home timeline tweets. Embedding space approaches have become the largest source of out-of-network tweets. So they're also doing some embedding space stuff. I'm not sure really how, but here's GraphJet. Um, let's see if there's any interesting um, pictures. So there's a picture there. <laughs> this is just a picture of some nodes pointing to each other. Hubs, circle of trust of users. Okay, I don't think, um, yeah, I guess there's too many pictures for me to, I guess, pick one. Uh, the first one looks interesting though. Let me just see if there's anything else. This is a longer paper. They're gonna use Zookeeper, which is Apache Zookeeper, which I think is um, essentially like, uh, some people saw the, the Chubby, the Google Chubby paper and, and implemented a version of Chubby uh, in the open source world. I think that's what Zookeeper is, so like a lock, um, a lock, a distributed locking system. Um, overall architecture of who to follow user recommendation service. So FlockDB is presumably some sort of database. Um, we've got real-time recommendations, HDFS, high something distributed file system, maybe. Whatever Kosov Kosovari is, real-time recommendations. Uh, and then Fetcher, I guess, will fetch things from Blender. Maybe Blender is like a mixture of tweets. And then the w, a, a w, a WTF database. Who to follow? Right? Okay. And then, but where's the graph? This is a, I'm just curious what FlockDB is. Do we, do we find out what FlockDB is? Okay. The graph snapshots and HDFS are in turn ingested from the front end graph store. So, so FlockDB is the graph store. And uh, Kosovari is an in-memory graph processing engine, a custom system we wrote from scratch and later open sourced. Then what is HDFS? Maybe I can find it um, on the internet. Oh, it's Hadoop. Okay. So Hadoop is also like a, yeah. Uh, Apache Hadoop's MapReduce and HDFS components were inspired by Google's paper on MapReduce and Google File System. So this is uh, standard distributed uh, engineering stuff, but graph database as opposed to like a SQL database or like a um, key value store database. Okay, and then we have embedding spaces. Embedding spaces approaches aim to answer a more general question about content similarity. What treats and users are similar to my interests? Um, so they're going to tell us, uh, we're going to generate a numerical representation of users' interest in tweets. Mm -hmm. We can then calculate the similarity between any two users, tweets, or user tweet pairs in this embedding space. Provided we generate accurate embeddings, we can use this similarity as a stand-in for relevance. One of Twitter's most useful embedding spaces is sim clusters. Sim clusters discover communities anchored by a cluster of influential users using a custom matrix factorization algorithm. Really? There are 145,000 communities, which are updated every three weeks. So 145,000 communities, okay. These are like Usenet, Usenet groups or, or subreddits, I guess. Um, like virtual subreddits, I'll, I'll think of them as. Uh, and there's 145,000 of them. And you kind of belong to one if this matrix algorithm, matrix, fact, matrix, matrix factorization algorithm says that you do. And then users and tweets are represented in the space of communities 
and can belong to multiple communities. They range in size. Yeah, yeah. Here are some of the biggest communities. Okay, so what do we have? Pop, like I guess popular stuff, like um, pretty celebrities and Justin Timberlake, who might, I guess he's also a pretty celebrity. Um, soccer, yeah, probably the most uh, popular sport in the world. So, out of curiosity, soccer, also known as football. <laughs> outside of the US. Um, and then we have, uh, what is this? I can't really read the font, but I think that's Bollywood. And then news. Okay. So what's up here? NBA. NBA is much smaller than, than, than soccer. And then we can embed tweets in these communities by looking at the current popularity of a tweet in each community. Okay, so I'm not sure. So, uh, okay, let's look at the sim cluster stuff. All right, this is some sort of paper. I'm not sure if I get the full text, but um, I'll bookmark it for, for my later viewing. And some sparse binary factorization from undirected graph that uses Metropolis Hastings. So I think Metropolis Hastings is like a... Um, I'm not sure if, it, if it's Monte Carlo, um, but it, it, it's some randomized like integration algorithm, isn't it? You don't need to know anything about that in order to use this package. Um, so is this really... Is this like deterministic matrix factorization? At some point, we are going to get to the code, I guess. And so, all right, so Metropolis Hastings is, yeah, so it's Markov chain Monte Carlo, obtaining, obtaining a sequence of random sample from a probability distribution, from which direct sampling is difficult. I think we're integrating, aren't we? Compute an integral. Okay. So somehow they're going to use uh, numerical integration randomized numerical integration methods to, to, to do this matrix factorization. They, um, machine learning people call this an embedding. I'm not sure if this is, if they mean this to be like an, an actual embedding in the mathematical sense, but, um, I think that what machine learning people mean by an embedding is, um, it's like a mapping from real world, real world stuff, um, like users and your interests or whatever encoded in some structs or strings or whatever. And then, um, mapped into some, typically I think a vector space. So some high, high dimensional vector space. And, um, that, 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 that is like, I guess, continuous in the topological sense. So, um, um, so things, things that are close, uh, um, in the, uh, in, in the embedding space should, should be close in the, um, in the original space and, and, and ideally vice versa. But um, embedding implies, at least to me, it seems to imply that like all of the structure in the original space is kind of preserved in the um, in the in the in the target space in an, in an injective way. But I, I don't. It doesn't seem like that's really possible since we don't know what the we don't really know anything about the topology of the real world space, as far as I know. Okay, so ranking. Um, the goal of the For You timeline is to serve uh, relevant tweets. At this point in the pipeline, you have 1,500 candidates that may be relevant. Okay, scoring directly predicts the relevance of each candidate and is the primary signal of ranking tweets for your, on your timeline. At this stage, all candidates are treated equally without regard for what candidate source it originated from. Okay, so basically ignore the, the candidate source. Ranking is achieved with a roughly uh, 48 million parameter neural network. Okay. That's continuously trained on tweet interactions to optimize for positive engagement. Okay, so we are estimating a function. This function has 48 million parameters. Um, and what does it do? You're going to input tweets or some set of tweets, maybe a graph of tweets. Um, and it's going to um, try to, um, like, I guess, like minimize some cost function. And that cost function is, is essentially encoding uh, whether you will like, retweet, or reply. Or I guess... Um, since these are good things, we'll say that it's maximizing some some cost function, or I forget what you call a cost function. You maximize, but that that's more or less what it's doing. So it's trying to make it's 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 showing you things that that, that are going to optimize engagement, um, which is you know what we talked about before. So this is driving the 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 goal is to drive the Twitter business metrics. Um, the ranking mechanism takes into account thousands of features and outputs ten labels, ten labels to give each tweet a score where each label represents the probability of engagement. So they're going to try to estimate, directly estimate the probability of engagement. 
Okay. And then using that, they're just presumably going to, re to return the highest probability uh, tweets. And then we've got the, uh, oh, I see some, um, some, some comments, really hardcore streaming. <laughs> Thanks. And then Rackstaff, um, who's been, who's been around a bunch of my streams and has helped me a lot with the, uh, with like C and C++ stuff. Um, so I can't really follow some of the math statistical stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, cool. And then, uh, Joshua, you just got to drop off. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Joshua. And, and thanks for stopping by. Um, and this will be up, uh, up later. Yeah. So this will be, a, um, I'll upload the high, high definition version. So that, that will be, I think the, the way that most people consume, consume this. Um, Okay, so heuristics, filters, and product features. Um, yeah, we're going to apply heuristics, filters, and product features. Um, so visibility filtering, this is like uh, things that you've blocked, I guess, and preferences. Um, author diver avoid too many consecutive tweets from a single... Okay, okay. Author diversity, I, I had kind of a... Um, what's the word? Uh, skeptical? Uh, cynical? <laughs> cynical take of what author diversity would be. But um, in this case... You know, if my friend Chuck tweets a thousand times a day, I, I don't want to only see his tweets. Um, I want to see more people. Okay, so, that, so that's great. Content balance is ensuring we're delivering a fair balance of in-network and out-of-network tweets. Okay, so that's also different when I, than what I thought it would be. So that's um, a fair. I don't think this is a fairness issue. <laughs> I don't think this is a fairness issue. But I think what they mean is they're trying to... Um, uh, they said that they wanted to balance 50-50. So um, there's maybe some feedback mechanism where if they give you too many in-network tweets in one batch, maybe the next batch will try to do out-of-network tweets or something along those lines. I don't know how it works. There's lots of ways you could do it. Then we have feedback-based fatigue. We're gonna, they're going to lower the score of certain tweets if the viewer has provided negative feedback around it. Okay, so if, I guess, I don't know if you can dislike things or you can just report them or whatever. So if, um, if I say I don't like th something, however that works on Twitter, Twitter will take that into account. And then social proof, exclude out of network tweets without a second degree connection if the tweet ha uh, as a quality safeguard. Okay, so this is kind of like social proof, but it's more like, um, it's, a, it's, like a, it's an additional bar. It's an, addi an additional hoop that out of network tweets have to jump through. In other words, ensure someone you follow engaged with the tweet or follows the tweet's author. Okay. So conversations provide more context to a reply by threading it together with the original tweet. That seems useful. And then edited tweets. Determine if the tweets currently on a device are stale and send instructions to replace them with edited versions. I don't know how it does that, but I guess um, maybe the Twitter server, like when you when your phone wakes up or whatever, uh, maybe the Twitter server is going to somehow push or you, or you ask for um, uh, like a list of IDs of, of tweets that have been edited. In mixing and serving. Um, so at this point, Home Mixer has a set of tweets ready to send your device. At the last step of the process, the system blends together tweets and other non-tweet content like ads, follow recommendations, and onboarding prompts. Onboarding prompts? Is this for logged out users? Like, what are you, what are you onboarding if you're logged in? I, I don't know what that might be. How much a return to the to device to display? Then the pipeline above runs approximately 5 billion times per day. Is that a lot? And completes in under 1.5 seconds on average. Okay, a single, uh, is it 5 billion? This presumably is across a bunch of servers. A single pipeline execution requires 220 seconds of CPU time, nearly 150 times the latency you perceive in the app. Okay, so 220 seconds of CPU time and completes in 1.5 seconds on average. So presumably, it does this by parallel computation. All right, and we get some Zoolander photo. Uh, photo. The goal of our open source endeavor is to provide full transparency to you, our users, about how our systems work. Well, we're not going to get full transparency, obviously, but um, presumably additional transparency is the goal. Um, We've released the code powering a recommendation. You can do it here and here. This is what GitHub, where I am on my other tab, and this ML thing, which um, 
we might be here forever. I forgot there was a second repo. Um, some of the new developments are a better Twitter analytics platform for creators with more information on reach and engagement, okay? Greater transparency uh, into any safety labels applied to your tweets and accounts and greater visibility on why tweets appear in your timeline. I guess that would be good. And then there's some like marketing stuff about what's next. Okay, so that's their blog post. That was way longer than I thought it would be. That was 45 minutes. Um, so let's dump, let's jump into the code. Uh, we've got a readme, which seems to contain a bunch of the same stuff. And I guess we get some sort of guide. Main components, I guess we might as well read this feature. So the SIM clusters is the community de detection stuff. TWHIN is the dense knowledge graph embeddings for users and tweets. Trust and safety models, models for detecting not safe for work and abusive content. Real graph model to predict likelihood of a Twitter user interacting with another user. Tweep cred is a page rank algorithm for calculating Twitter user reputation. Okay. Three cost injector, streaming event processor for building input streams for graph jet based services. Graph feature service serves graph features for a directed pair of users. For example, how many of users user A's following how many of user A's following like tweets from user B? And candidate source stuff like search index, CR mixer, coordination layer for fetching out of network tweet candidates. User entity graph contains an in-memory user to tweet interaction graph. Follow recommendation services provides users with recommendations to who to follow. The light ranker and the heavy ranker. So the light ranker is used by search index to rank tweets and heavy ranker is the neural network ranking for candidate tweets. And then we have home mixer, the main service used to construct and serve the home timeline. Visibility feature filters, Timeline Ranker, the legacy service which provides relevance scores tweets from the early bird search index and UTAG service. And then software framework Navi, machine learning model serving written in Rust. That's for serving the model. I have no idea how machine learning models are like served as a service. So that's interesting to me personally, but probably not so interesting to people in general who want to know about what's up with this recommendation algorithm. And then we have product mixer a software framework for building feeds of content and TWML, legacy machine learning framework. So what's in the ML um, repo? Project open sources some of the ML models used at Twitter. Currently, these are the For You Heavy Ranker, the TWHIN embeddings, and they require Python. Mm, right, so how are we gonna do this? Uh, all right, let's think. You can definitely ignore a CI. You can ignore docs. Um, I'll ignore Na Navi, although I'm, I'm really curious about it. It seems like one of the things we want to know um, I think one thing we want to know is trust and safety. Um, Maybe we want to know, I think we want to look at heavy ranker. Um, maybe home mixer. Visibility filters, maybe home mixer. And then if people in the chat have something that they really want me to get to, uh, let me know. Um, because this is a huge amount of stuff and I'm already um, almost an hour in and so there's, there's simply no way for me to get to everything. Um, okay, so here's the trust and safety models. Um, so PNSFW media, so we're gonna detect tweets tweet with non-safe work and uh, images, and then text toxicity and abuse. And there are zero contributors. And this is just to read me, okay. Abusive, let's look at toxicity, I guess. This seems like the um, least likely to, to uh, run into trouble, maybe. Um, so we have load model, rescoring, and train. And then we have utils, settings, optim, and data. What is data? 
I'm going to click on data just for fun. So data preprocessing, data frame loader, and MB generator. I don't know what MB is. Um, so let's just see like if we can recognize any of the uh, machine. So we've got NumPy and Pandas, sklearn, and TensorFlow. Those are all uh, common Python libraries for, um, for doing machine learning stuff. This is a bunch of machine learning code that I have uh, no idea how to follow. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to see what sort of stuff is in, is in these files. Um, we'll look at at least some of these machine learning files closely. Uh, I'm not sure that this is the one I want to do first. I'm just kind of poking around to see um, to see what's here to get a feel for to get a feel for the repo. So what's so train.py, I'm gonna guess is for training stuff. Um, and it looks like we're using TensorFlow. And if you don't have TensorFlow, it's gonna just print out no no TFA. All right. Um, and it's going to take a bunch of stuff, including MB size, the learning rate, weight decay, optimizer name, train epics. Okay. A seed, presumably, oops, a seed, presumably a random seed. Um, mm -hmm. I still don't know what MB is. Uh, and then hugging face is something I think I've, I've heard on, I've heard of, but let's look it up. Hugging Face is an American company that develops tools for building applications using machine learning. It is most notable for its transformers library built for natural language processing. Okay, so some natural language processing or NLP library stuff. Mm, some callback stuff. Here's some logits. So maybe this is for the logistic regressions. What is BERT tweet? Is this uh, maybe like a BERT model for tweets? Bert's a machine learning thing, right? Is this Transformers? Yeah, masked word completion with Bert. But I forget what Bert is, but it's um we get uh let's ask Bard. I think it's an acronym, so I'll capitalize it. Bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. It is a machine learning model that is used for natural language processing NLP. First introduced by Google AI in 2018, it's a bidirectional model, which means that it can take into account the context of a word in a sentence, both before and after the word. Okay, so we're gonna um, select the word context in this case. Um, we're going to know things like the stuff before it and the stuff after it. And we're going to use that to, to, to uh, whatever, try to figure out what the word means. This is in contrast to unidirectional models, which can only take into account the context of a word before it. Um, so at least naively, that means we have to, um, if we're going to know before and after, we're going to have to maybe backtrack in some sense. Okay. There's some transformer thing that, that takes into account um, before and after stuff. Um, and then uh, somebody says, uh, some, oh, hello from India. Hello. Oh, cool. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, they say they, uh, Data Oil says so they, they saw the um, TCP Linux, Linux video. Oh, thanks. I'm glad, I'm glad you thought it was great. Dependency management tool that they're using. Sure. I don't know anything about dependency management. I, uh, uh, Data Oil, are you saying um, for... Let me, maybe let me know what you mean. Um, in the Python world, dependency management, like I'm familiar with pip, um, and that's basically all I'm familiar with. But um, like, I don't know if there's like a dependency management in the context of like machine learning or whatever. Somehow I scrunch this window and I need to unscrunch it if I want to see people's comments. Can I do that? Let's try that. Hey. Let me get some cats, which I did not mean to click on. All right. Um, so yeah, I'll keep a lookout for um, dependency management, but I'm, I'm curious if you mean something um, something more, something different from just like the, the Python dependencies. 
Okay. Um, and then let's, the, the, so that's a, just a flavor of with some of the um, files in the main, the algorithm repo. So let's get a flavor of the files in the um, machine learning repo. Okay, so we've got uh, logging, metrics. I'm gonna look at metrics. Machines, optimizers. Optimizers is interesting from a, uh, from a technical point of view. Reader, who knows what reader is in tools. Uh, and I guess common and core. And then what's an image? So metrics is uh, RCE, all rock, and aggregation. So now they're using Torch. And hey, look, we get uh, whatever this is, some sort of, um, it will take us to the like definition and stuff like that. Uh, right, torch and Torch metrics. Stable, mean, dist, reduce, FN, update. Okay. Um, if you've seen my other videos, um, I'm, I'm doing something a little bit different because I'm trying to, uh, I have, I have no idea really what this, what these repos are about. So, um, I'm kind of like poking in really quickly and just getting like a gut, a gut feeling. Um, and then I'm going to go through and do whatever my, my normal thing is. So this is optimizer slash config.py. And we've got things like piecewise constant, linear ramp to constant. These are, I guess, different kinds of functions, class uh, learning rate, um, atom config, whatever atom is, I guess maybe part of torch and get optimizer algorithm config. All right. So here's another op. So L R compute a learning rate, L R shim. Okay. And then build optimizer. So what is a machine is Venv. Uh, I guess that's like a virtual environment list ops, list ops, input string, separator string, simple, st uh, string slit parsing on imp of input string. Hmm. Environment has readers. If on KF machines config environment is JSON load machines config. It task type is chief. Data set worker, data set dispatcher. Maybe these are um, uh, like like a leader, like uh, maybe not leader election type stuff, but like this is maybe the chief is maybe the job configurer, and then worker data set worker is some worker machine that's um, working on a data set, and then maybe a dispatcher is another type of machine that um, coordinates work along with the chief. Perhaps I don't know what KF is. Slurm I recognize as a um, what is it called? High, like a, maybe a, like a high performance computing scheduler. I think Slurm workload manager. Simple Linux utility for resource management. Um, it's a job scheduler for Linux and Linux Unix like kernels used by many of the world's supercomputers and computer clusters. Okay, so that's Slurm. So if Slurm, our options are either Slurm or KF. So maybe let's try um, KF scheduler. This seems promising. Schedule tasks, learn how to schedule tasks to run periodic jobs. Great, but what is KF? KF offers developers the Cloud Foundry experience while empowering operate. What does it stand for? Oh, Kubernetes. Oh, Kubernetes something. GitHub. Google. Oh, it's a Google thing. This is not officially supported product. What does it stand for? Well, Bard will know, right? Bard, you know all the Google stuff I expect. It's a component of the Kubernetes cluster management system that's responsible for scheduling pods to nodes. Okay. Um, it uses a variety of factors to make scheduling decisions. Yeah, yeah. But what does it stand for? So K is Kubernetes. 
if we're unlocked and no independent graphics. And this doesn't sound right. Unless it's unless it's like a a, a pun on, on something from um, Unix. Okay, so Data Oil says uh, where all the dependencies would be mentioned and used to update package and publish a repo. <laughs> They're using Poetry because they have the this Pi project to ML file. Okay. Um, yeah, I have no idea what Poetry is, but let's look that up. I guess Python. A Python dependency management thing. Okay. Yeah, but what are you? Is there Wikipedia? How about PyPy? Um, helps you declare, manage, and install dependencies of Python. Ensure you get the right stack everywhere. Okay. All right, so it's some dependency manager. I don't know um, how it's different from other things, but I, presumably people like it. Um, okay, so KF is this Kubernetes. Okay, so the machines, this machines file. I figured out one one file seems to be detecting. You know, you can schedule jobs using Slurm, or on the the Kubernetes job scheduler, um, and uh, you know. This is some sort of compatibility layer, layer between those two things. I don't know if they have some Slurm clusters and some Kubernetes clusters, and they're um, either are, are planning to support both forever or they're you know migrating from one or another. But that, that seems to be what this this file is about. Reader, um, where's the entrance? The entrance point is init, which is usually empty, right, for Python. Um, what do we think? DDS or maybe DDS? Dataset service orchestrated by a TF job. So TF job, I'm going to assume is a TensorFlow job. And we are importing TensorFlow as TF. Maybe start data set service. If the environment doesn't have any readers, we're going to return. I, okay. Um, and then we'll do some, uh, I guess, packaging stuff. If env is dispatcher, I don't know if this means if we are the, like the dispatcher machine. Oh yeah, we just saw these machines. So if we are the dispatcher, I guess, maybe, maybe it's the best sort in env, then um, we're gonna get the reader port and log some stuff about DDS journaling directory and get the work dir. And we're gonna create a server, uh, tf.data.experimental.service.dispatch <laughs> server. TF, okay, so I guess TensorFlow has some notion of a dispatch server. We're gonna call server join. Uh, join is often uh, like joining threads, but I don't, you don't, I don't often see join in the context of servers. Um, so, so I'm not sure. Um, otherwise, if we're not the dispatcher, we might be the reader. And we're gonna start some uh, TensorFlow experimental worker config thing. Um, oh, we're going to start some sort of worker server, I guess, that is passed in a worker config, and we're going to call server join. Then we're going to register data set, and we're going to give it a TensorFlow data set and a data set service, which is a string, I guess, the identifier for a service and whether to use compression. And we're going to check the dist rank. I mean, if it's zero, uh, we'll set data set ID to register I guess we'll call register data set and it's going to return a data set ID. And this seems to be job scheduling stuff. Dist.broadcast object list. I guess we'll we'll notify other things about what our about our ID and job. And we'll return the uh the ID and job as a tuple. Okay. So the the work here um seems to be done by this um TensorFlow experimental uh, server. In, in, in process, tf.data service dispatch server. It coordinates a cluster of worker servers. When the workers start, they register themselves with the dispatcher. OK, cool. So this is distributed computing stuff rather than uh, like machine learning stuff per se. Um, and then what's in core debug training loop. It seems kind of interesting. Loss type 
and losses. Let's look at loss type and losses. Metric mixin. I guess we can probably ignore, but we'll look at train pipeline. And do we want to look at config? I guess I'll look at custom training loop and config. Base config test. I guess let's look at training.py. This is training config. Okay. Okay. Um, losses. Uh, maybe warrant build loss. So you're going to give it a loss type and a reduct. I don't know what a reduction is, uh, but mean, I guess we're going to, um, we have some loss function and we want to maybe, um, uh, um, optimize or like, uh, minimize the mean of the loss or yeah, something like that. Um, the less define loss function of logits in labels. So lo the, uh, uh, logits is presumably the logistic regression. So where does logits come from? I don't know, but it's, um, so we have this loss function of type torch. So logits is of type torch, the tensor. So some, um, tensor labels are also to everything's a tensor. I don't know if, um, in torch, like, or in tensorflow, like everything is a tensor or if it tries to model everything as a tensor, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Uh, so pause weights. All right. So losses, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this, this seems like it's maybe part of the, uh, logistic stuff. So, um, there was that like warning or whatever about how the, um, logistic stuff wasn't trained in a while. So just out of curiosity, I'm going to blame and see, oh, well, everything's four days ago. Right. So, <laughs> okay. So, not, so never mind. That's not so useful. Um, and then loss type, we have cross entropy or BCE with logits. Cross entropy is some, um, is some, I think it's a measure of, 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 of like the, like a, maybe not quite a metric, but, um, like almost like a distance function on, on probability distributions. Um, I think and then BCE with logits, I'm not sure what BCE is. Was I just looking at cross entropy? In information theory, the cross entropy between two probability distributions, P and Q, over the same underlying set of events. So it's in the same, um, essentially two, I guess, two measures on the, on the same set. Measures the average number of bits needed to identify an event drawn from the set. If a coding scheme used for the set is optimized, for an estimated probability distribution Q rather than the true distribution P. So H of PQ is equal to negative uh, expected value with respect to P of log Q. So standard sort of entropy stuff. Um, how is this different from mutual information? So Mutual information is something to, oh, this is what I was thinking, Kubler-Lee book. So, okay, so this is uh, P, I guess, whatever the symbol is, Q. We're gonna sum over X of P of X log of the, of the ratio. Okay, so, so it, it is different, um, but it seems similar in spirit. Okay, so that's cross entropy. Then what is BCE? Statistics, maybe? BCE with logits loss. This is a, maybe a PyTorch thing. This loss combines a sigmoid layer and the BCE loss in one single class. So what is BCE loss? Binary, binary cross entropy. Seems like the same thing as regular cross entropy, but I guess this one has logits. I have no idea why you would use uh, like PyTorch over TensorFlow or, or like it's, they, they seem to be using both. If anyone knows anything about um, how you would make that sort of decision, like as a, as a business or as a machine learning person, I, I'd be really curious to hear. Okay, so here's trainpipeline.py in, in, in uh, the algorithm ML slash core. And they're going to use Torch in the autograd profiler. And 
something about sending stuff to devices, wait for batch, um, train pipeline base. Yeah. Okay. Pipeline forward. All right. So custom training loop, just uh, get new iterator. To obtain the new iterator from the iterable, uh, if the iterable uses data set blah, blah, internally, this doesn't look so exciting. Get step function. I'm going to give it a pipeline, a data iterator, a training. And it's going to return whatever a step function is. Uh, torch no grad, maybe no gradient. Run evaluation. Run the evaluation loop over all evaluation iterators. So uh, I guess we're going to iterate, it, iterate over the data. Let's look at this. Okay, so data set is we're going to call get new iterator on, uh, 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 on the data set. Um, step function is we're going to call get step function, giving it the pipeline, the data set, and set training to false. The last time is now. We're going to log, and then we're going to um, iterate over the eval steps and get the, for each, I guess, eval step, get the outputs and update the metrics with the outputs. And then eval x per s. It's going to be equal to this thing, batch size times eval steps divided by now, uh, uh, oh, I guess divided by the difference between now and last time. So basically the, 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 um, the elapsed time. So batch size time steps, um, per, uh, I guess elapsed time or something. And the metrics result is going to be called metrics compute. And then we're going to reset the metrics and return metrics result. So are the metrics the things that give you the um, the machine learning stuff, the the model, the goodness? And then train, we're going to take a bunch of parameters. And I'm just curious, like, do we return something? Okay, so we have some snapshotting. So if last, uh, pen, if last pending snapshot, I guess we'll wait for it. If checkpoint frequency and step modulo checkpoint frequency is non-zero. So I guess we'll check it to see if we have like some remainder modulo the frequency. We're going to um, set the last pending snapshot to be some checkpoint snapshot, some checkpoint handler save of global step equals step times dist get world size. So save if we did not just save. Okay. All right. Um, and then let's take a look at these other two files. This is common log weights, run training, and what is images requirements? App sale is a Google thing. Aptors, arrow, a bunch of stuff. Okay. So that's, um, I'm beginning to get a sense of the, of the repo and the sense I'm get, beginning to get is that like, um, from the point of view of the of the machine learning, um, everything is is ultimately using uh, the, the like TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. Um, we have a sense of what the loss functions are. We're seeing a lot of the logit stuff, which is also in the blog post. Um, but since we don't have the data, um, it's I I guess it's um, it's not clear to me how much you can gain by kind of looking at the, the definitions of the machine learning models and code. And maybe if anybody is, is, is watching on the chat and um, wants to correct me that there's, that there's something especially interesting to look at, I'm guessing that, that maybe that's not the most important part of, of this source code release, at least at the first, at, 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 on the first look. Um, maybe if you're like a machine learning expert, uh, you, uh, you have like, you know, best practices that you want to check for or, or like common mistakes you want to check for or, or something like that. But, um, I'm not in any place to do that sort of thing. And so it seems like, um, th this source code looks to me a bit like, um, grab a data set, send it to TensorFlow. Here's the loss function. Come back when you have data and then update, update the, um, update the, uh, the, the, the like the snapshot or whatever. Um, so I'm going to, Go ahead and assume for now um, that the algorithm ML is, is something I can ignore. I'm going to pull it out into its own tab and put it in the background. I think 
Um, yeah, I'll do that. And then I'll look at the um, the 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 what I think is the main repository, which is just the dash algorithm. All right. And so what do we want to see here? The one thing I want to see is uh, I think I want to see home mixer and timeline ranker. Let's look at timeline ranker. I don't know. Right. Let's look at sim clusters. Let's do this now. So um the general purpose representation layer based on overlapping communities, in which users as well as heterogeneous content can be captured as sparse interpretable vectors to support a multitude of recommendation tasks. So this is the thing that, that kind of created, uh, you know, what I was calling virtual communities. Um, so we're going to get some directed graph. Um, follow relationships are perhaps the most naturally thought of as a directed graph, where each node is a user and each edge represents a follow. Yeah? It can also be viewed as a bipartite graph, where nodes are grouped into two sets, producers and consumers. In the bipartite graph, producers are the users who are followed, and consumers are the followees. So here's uh, the, the kind of the bipartite the bipartite view of the um, original graph. The community detection, the bipartite follow graph can be used to identify groups of producers who have similar followers or who are known for a topic. Specifically, the bipartite follow graph can also be represented as an M by N matrix A, where consumers are represented as U and producers as V. We have a matrix. Um, this is basically just an adjacency matrix, right? Um, and then we're going to do some cosine similarity between, let's say, V1 and V2, I guess, based on these binary vectors. And that's going to give us uh, the edge weights between V1 and V2. So, and that's of the producers. Do we get something similar for the consumers? Okay, so producer, producer. Producer producer similarity is computed as the cosine similarity between users who follow each producer. The resulting cosine similarity values can be used to construct producer producer similarity graph where the nodes are producers and edges are weighted by the corresponding cosine similarity value. Let me do some noise removal. Then we use Metropolis Hastings. Sampling based community detection is then run on the producer producer similarity graph to identify a community affiliation for each producer. The algorithm takes in a parameter K and the number of communities to be detected. I don't know if community is a uh, graph theory term. So clique is a graph theory term for sure. Mm -hmm. Community structure maybe? If the nodes in the network could be easily grouped into potentially overlapping sets of nodes such that each node is densely connected internally. Yeah. Clique. Uh, let's see, what is that? So, I'm gonna ask Bard what's known about um, the time complexity of community detection algorithms and graphs. I thought that some stuff like maybe clique detection um, was maybe NP or, or something something like that. Uh, is a topic of active research. There are a number of different algorithms. Yeah, yeah. In general, community detection algorithms can be divided into two categories, greedy algorithms and modularity-based algorithms. Greedy algorithms start with a random partition of the graph and iteratively merge communities that are connected by many edges. Modularity-based algorithms, on the other hand, start with a random graph and then iteratively optimize modularity function. Uh, it's typically linear in the number of edges in the graph for the greedy ones. Okay, a modularity is typically quadratic in the number of edges. Then we've got some heuristics. Okay. 
So let's look up uh, maybe clique detection on complexity. I must have been thinking of something else because this seems to be polynomial. Okay. Oh, most version. Okay, here we go. Most versions of the clique problem are hard. The clique decision problem is NP complete and is, I guess, one of CARP's 21 NP complete problems. The problem of finding a maximum clique is both fixed parameter intractable and hard to approximate. And listing all maximal cliques may require exponential time, as there exist graphs with exponentially many maximal cliques. Therefore, much of the theory about the clique problem is devoted to identifying special types of graph that admit more efficient algorithms, or to establishing the computational difficulty of the general problem in various models of computation. Okay, so, but I saw something else about polynomial. Uh, so, Braun Kerbosch algorithm can be used to list all maximal cliques in a worst case optimal time, and it is also possible to list them in polynomial time per clique. Okay. So, it seems like, um, let's also ask ChatGPT. Um, seems like uh, at least if you think of communities as cliques, it's a it's a hard problem in general. On chat GPT. Um, but so maybe that's why they're using uh, Metropolis Hastings. I don't know if they're deterministically finding communities or if um, it's essentially a randomized algorithm. Many community detection algorithms have a time complexity of ON squared. Okay. That's sim that's, I think the same thing as what um, Bard was saying. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bard. Thanks, ChatGPT. Okay. So uh, we've got this Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Where was I? Here. Okay. Uh, and then we have consumer embeddings using interested in. An interested in matrix U can be computed by multiplying the matrix representation of the follow graph. A. So we've got some follow graph A, which seems like an adjacency matrix. I'm not sure if it is. By the known four matrix V. Uh, so UMK, I guess, is communities by consumers. And we're going to, that's going to be equal producers by consumers times communities uh, by producers. Okay. And then we have producer embeddings. And this is going to be the I think this is the cosine similarity thing we just saw, or maybe it's a different cosine similarity thing. Then we have entity embeddings. Sim clusters can also be used to generate embeddings for different kinds of content, such as tweets and topics. When a tweet is created, its tweet embedding is initialized as an empty vector. Tweet embeddings are updated each time the tweet is favorited. Specifically, the interested in vector for each user who faved the tweet is added to the tweet vector. The tweets have some vector which is initialized as the empty vector, presumably some kind of sparse vector, because you know my tweets will get a small number of entries, but uh, who did we see? Uh, Selena Gomez's tweets will get a, um, a large vector, I guess. Um, update each time the tweet is favorited. Um, the interested in vector of each user who favored the tweet is added to the tweet vector. So we have some, okay, each user has an interested in vector. And I guess we're going to do maybe vector addition. Where uh, the interested in vector is added to the tweet vector. Since tweet embeddings are updated each time a tweet is favorited, they change over time. <laughs> they sure do. And then they're critical for our tweet recommendation tasks. We can calculate tweet similarity and recommend similar tweets to users based on their tweet engagement history. Okay, and then we have topic embeddings are determined by taking the cosine similarity between consumers who are interested in a community and the number of aggregated favorites each consumer has taken on a tweet that has a topic annotation. Okay, so this is another cosine similarity thing with these matrices, topics, and communities, communities and consumers, and topics and consumers. And then uh, and we have a bunch of components, so known for interesting embeddings. So these are basically the topic headings we just saw. And GCP jobs. This Google compute stuff. We have a GCP pipeline where we build our SIM clusters ANN. ANN. 
Is that some um, not adversarial neural, neural network? Is it? Artificial neural network, okay. Um, index via BigQuery it allows us to do fast iterations and build new embeddings more efficiently compared to scalding, whatever scalding is. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is sim clusters. Um, the the readme seems pretty um, pretty thorough. But we've got some HS, HDFS stuff. This is like a Hadoop file system. Um, I don't know what images is. Are these like literal like pictures? Oh, these are just pictures of the things. Okay, <laughs> this is for the diagrams that we just saw. SCIO, who knows, score and stores. Scu uh, summing bird, tweet similarity. Let's just like pick a, a few of these and poke around. Maybe let's look at candidate source. Cluster ranker. Hey, look at this, this looks interesting. Okay, so uh, online tweet embedding pipeline. Okay, so where are we? Summing bird. The Heron jobs generate the tweet embedding and index of tweets for sim clusters. Let's ignore this for now, at least. So tweet similarity, model-based tweet similarity cluster embedded, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let's look at this. And then we, oh, this is Scala. Okay. Uh huh. So I think we're just defining some object, right? And we, I guess this might be a function. I don't know how Scala syntax works, but we've got a query embedding, a candidate embedding, and whether it's normalized. And uh, I guess maybe we're returning a data record. And are we doing anything interesting? Um, adapt to data. So we're calling adapt to data record on query adapter. Then we're going to call data record merger merge on feature data record. Okay. I uh, there's no doesn't seem like we get a view of the of the actual much of the actual algorithm there. So here's cluster ranker dot scala, and this is a candidate source. Do we see the candidate source have anything interesting in the readme? No. Are they using Basil? They've got build files. All right. Okay, so I think it was what we're a cluster ranker. Given a map of clusters, sort out the top scoring clusters by ranking scheme provided by the caller. So get top K clusters by score. Uh huh. And we're going to get scored clusters, which is going to be um, like a map, presumably like a kind of hash map from integers to uh, user to interested in cluster scores. And then a rank by score. And a top K, maybe this is like the top, you want the top five, you'd pass in five here or something. And you're going to return a map from ints to doubles. And what are we doing? Rank score match, uh, rank by fave score. So we're going to rank things by, I guess, the favorited score, by um, followed score, like some of the following data, by log fave score. I guess favorite score, but but logarithmically scaled. Um, rank by normalized log fave score. <laughs> I don't know why we need all of these different different rankings um, of of essentially favorite. I mean, presumably you get, you know, sometimes when you're doing something like a regression, um, you know you'll start adding things because it seems like there's additional information. And so you like, you know, well, what if I take log of this thing or if I square it or, or whatever? So maybe um, they started with fave score. They're like, well, there's some additional information that's not really in this variable the way we want it to be. So we'll try taking the log and we'll try taking the normalized log or, or, or these are rather just cases. So maybe these are just different options you can choose, I guess, is, is really what's going on here since this seems to be a case. Um, a case match rather than, than a bunch of things that we're doing at the same time. Then we can also rank by, by normalized score. Okay. So this is just calling out the other functions. The functions are where the functions are in. Oh, no, these are, so this is just matching on some input. 
And so let's look at like log fave score. So you're gonna return, I guess, cluster ID and score dot log fave score get or else. So I guess zero zero is the default if you if you can't get the log fave score. And really, um, everything's happening in score. This function is not really doing anything, I think. Where did score come from? Uh, it's passed in here, uh, cluster ID score. Map cluster ID scores duh, 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 to math max. Yeah, I'm not sure really where, um, did it come from cluster with scores? So whatever score is, um, it has the real, it has the real data. So ranked clusters with scores is, uh, we're going to take the clusters with scores. Yeah. And then we're going to map over it. And then a cluster with scores, I think the syntax means like a cluster with scores is kind of like a, a tuple. And we're going to essentially pattern match on that tuple. So whatever, so um, get top clusters by score. It's just going to peek inside of the clusters with scores. And um, this function is just going to return different things depending on, on um, whatever uh, rank by score is. So it's kind of like um, it's basically doing dispatch, like that dynam dynamic dispatch in a sense. But um, and maybe like a not so, uh, kind of in a convoluted way, it seems like. Or at least convoluted to me. All right, so that's uh, this uh, source thing. What other sources do we have? Heavy ranker dot Scala. Okay. Um, so the heavy ranker stuff should be in the machine learning file. Um, so maybe we're just going to, uh, again, peek into that file. So we've got thrift. I think thrift is like Apache thrift, right? So that's like a alternative to protobufs. Look up Scala thrift. I think it seems to be Apache Thrift. A Thrift parser generator from Twitter. Yeah, Apache Thrift. Developed at Facebook. Like an RPC framework. Okay, some RPC framework. Let me look up. I'm going to think of it as basically protocol buffers. All right. Um, okay. So we've got this heavy ranker object. Um, and we've got this rank function, which takes a scoring algorithm. An embedding ID. I don't know if this is a vector in the embedding space or, or something else, an embedding type. A min score and candidates. And candidates is a sequence, it's some sort of collection of sim clusters tweet candidate. Similarity clusters tweet candidate, I guess. And you've got uniform score store ranker. We've got just different rankers. Okay. Sim clusters ANN candidate source. You get a big comment. This store looks for tweets whose similarity is close to the source sim cluster embedding sim clusters embedding ID. Approximate cosine similarity is the core algorithm to drive this store. Steps one to four are in fetch candidates method. Retrieve the sim clusters embedding. Okay. Fetch top n clusters top tweets. Calculate all the tweet candidates dot product of approximate cosine similarity to source tweet or approximate cosine similarity. Yeah. Take top m tweet uh, candidates by the step three score and then calculate the similarity score between source and candidate and return top n candidates. Oh, then some re ranking stuff. Okay. Warning only turn off step five for user interested in candidate generation. It's the only use case in Ricos that we use dot product to rank the tweet candidates. All right. And then this is more source stuff. Okay. All right, so that's that's um, a flavor of what's in at least uh, the, the, the community stuff. What was that called? Sim clusters. 
dense knowledge graph, trust and safety module models. I, I, I think I am interested in that. Um, take a look at, I guess, real graph. So real graph, BQE, I don't know what BQE is. This project builds a machine learning model using a gradient boosting tree classifier to predict the likelihood of a Twitter user interacting with another user. So we create a labeled data set of user interactions in a BigQuery table. To create the labeled data set, the algorithm first selects a set of candidate interactions by identifying all edges that were active during a certain time period. Okay, then it joins this candidate set with a set of labeled interactions that occurred one day after the candidate period. Positive interactions are labeled as one and negative interactions are zero. The resulting labeled data set is then used to train a boosted tree classifier model. And then real graph SCIO. What is BQ, uh, maybe BigQuery engine? And then whatever SCIO, maybe it's a different database or distributed database system. All right, all right. I have no idea what a gradient boosting tree classifier is, so I'll see if I can look it up. So the, okay, so we have, so boosting, uh, it's an ensemble meta algorithm. So I guess we're going to train a few things and like take some sort of uh, average over them or, or collection over them and also variance. Okay, um, we're going to convert weak, uh, weak learners into strong ones. And boosting is based on the question posed by Kearns and Valiant. A set of weak learners create a single strong learner. So we're going to take a, a bunch of weak learners and try to um, pull them together into, into a strong learner. Okay, so boosting, we're going to uh, train some weak models in some sense and uh, try to uh, cobble them together into a stronger model. Um, I don't know what gradient boosting is. So gradient boosting. Uh, used in regression and classification tasks. It gives a prediction model in the form of an ensemble of weak prediction models, which are typically decision trees. Okay, so we get some decision, some weak decision trees of some sort. Um, when a decision tree is a weak learner, the resulting algorithm is called gradient boosted trees. It usually outperforms a random forest. Okay. I don't know why it's called gradient boosting, but presumably gradients are somewhere, but I guess that's the sort of thing we're doing. So we're training some weak models. Um, okay, so we get injection in BQE in SIO, SCIO. Look what injection is. Edge list injection and user session injection. Let's look at user session injection. Uh, huh, we just small key value injection. is going to take a long and a user session. And I guess, <laughs> I guess they like create some sort of object that's long to big Indian and Scala compact thrift of user session. What does this other injection look like? Basically the same thing. Um, all right. And then in uh, BQE, we have scoring and training. Let's look at scoring candidates.sql. Okay, so it's all SQL files. This folder contains the SQL files that we'll use for scoring the real graph edges in BQ. We have four steps that take place. Check to make sure that the models are in place. That feature importance query should return 20 rows in total. All right, follow graph feature generations, candidate generation and scoring. And it's SQL. And we, get, we can figure out some of their rows and columns and that sort of thing. We get a left join. We're going to count some stuff. We're going to take min and coalesce. I don't remember what coalesce does. And we're going to select and rank and partition by some stuff. Okay. You know, SQL stuff. All right. Uh, what was I even looking at? This was the, um, the interaction graph. Okay. So uh, I don't think we really looked at Home Mixer. Maybe the last things, maybe I'll look at um, Home Mixer, Timeline Ranker. I'm gonna look at Navi anyway, I guess, and then we'll look at maybe visibility filters last. And if anyone is, um, is watching and wants to see something, uh, let me know. 
All right, so this is the home mixer thing uh, that can, that uh, creates the timelines. It powers for you following in lists. And is it gigantic? It doesn't seem too gigantic. Um, it is Scala. Home mixer thrift server warm up handler. Whatever that is. So service. It, what is service? Home mixer access policy alert config and tweet scored tweet service. I guess we'll look at the tweet scored tweet service. We have a controller, a candidate pipeline, conversation service candidate pipeline, uh, conversation service edited tweets, new tweets pill candidate timeline, timeline service response feature transformer. We'll just look at a couple of these. I'm basically picking random victims. Functional component. Uh, candidate source. Early bird candidate source. Similarity based and stale tweets. Cache. And then we have some filters. Out of network compet. This kind of looks interesting. Drop max candidates filter. Feedback fatigue filter. Oh, I want to look at this stuff. Okay. I'm going to pop these filters out to their own thing, I guess. And then what else? So, okay, so here's the home mixer server. You've got a bunch of imports. This is starting to look more like um, ordinary uh, code. And what do we do? Import a bunch of stuff. It seems like maybe this is export modules. Um, configure thrift, I guess, with some router and some filtering stuff. I don't know what a filter is. Maybe it's kind of like a handler. Um, configure HTTP and warm up. All right. And then scored tweet service is, I guess, going to be just like an RPC service, maybe. Get scored tweet response, the request type, and some params. And stitch. I don't know what stitch is doing, but uh, there's some product pipeline registry. All right. New tweets, pill candidate pipeline config. What are we importing? A bunch of stuff like decorators, mixer core. Uh huh. So we don't seem to be importing any like uh, machine learning stuff. Candidate pipeline config that creates new tweets, pill. I don't know what a pill is. Um, new tweets, pill candidate pipeline config is going to get a query unit. Show alert candidate, show alert candidate. We've got some decorators, a query transformer. Let me take a candidate pipeline query transformer. And what else? I don't know. A candidate pipeline config. Conversation service candidate pipeline config. Candidate pipeline config that fetches tweets from the conversation service candidate source. So we have some source of, of conversations and it's going to give us candidate tweets. All right. And this just seems like it's setting up, um, uh, just setting up different services. So we have tweet candidate here, tweet with conversation metadata. We've got filters, retweet duplication filter, feature filter from feature filter identifier, tweet, tweety pie hydrated filter ID. Predicate feature filter from predicate. I guess you could give it somehow a predicate and we'll filter based on whether that predicate returns true, maybe on the tweet. An invalid conversation module filter. All right. Here's the early bird candidate source. And this just seems to be um, like a definition of how to talk to something called early bird. I, I don't, I, I was curious what early bird is. But at least that file doesn't seem to say. Um, here's similarity based user candidate. This is kind of the same stuff. Okay. This all seems like um, like more like setup. Here's time ranker. I don't think I've looked at time ranker yet. A legacy service which provides relevant score tweets from the early bird search. Okay, early bird I guess is a search index, and user tweet entity graph. So it's um, Legacy. So I guess I will um, 
I will ignore it. And here's visibility lib. And here's what the repo root. And what is this? This is the ML root, which I will continue to ignore. Um, here's the functional components filter. So let's look at a couple of these. Um, I don't know if these are going to be implementations of filters or or if they're just um, like setting up services. So this is a pipeline query. Max candidate is going to be query params, max candidate params. Val kept removed is going to be candidates map over candidate split at max candidates. And then I guess stitch whatever stitch is, stitch.value, filter result, cap removed. And the filter identifier is drop max candidates. This doesn't really seem like an implementation of a filter, but let's see if, what else we can see. So predicate fil feature filter. Builds a simple filter out of a predicate function from the candidate to a Boolean. For clarity, we recommend including the name of the should keep candidate parameter. Okay, so a predicate function, candidates will be kept when this function returns true. So if should keep candidate returns true, then um, then you keep the, the tweet. So let's see if we can find uses of this filter in the code base. Let's use the definition. Here's the uh, more, I guess, definition stuff. Or you score tweets candidate pipeline. Here's an example of a call with from from predicate. I guess we'll pass it a filter identify and should keep is going to be features. Um, I guess uh, features get or else quoted tweet dropped feature is false. So it seems like even when we do get to see uses of this function, that um, we don't actually get this. You know, whatever get or else is list member feature. It's, it's like passing in um, a predicate that's essentially named by another thing. And um, I'm not sure if we see the, get to see the implementation of that thing. So let's see if we can find is list member feature. Maybe here. Is list member feature. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm getting the feeling that like, you know, in this source code release, um, we can't, at least, you know, on first pass, I can't quite see where a bunch of the computation is being done because it seems like um, ultimately it's being obscured by uh, some of the stuff might be like database lookups and th that might be part of what we see in the, in the, in the SQL. Um, but it seems like it, it's more about, you know, these filters are, are more about querying different services and, um, at least it's not immediately e easy to see where um, what the actual work that those services are doing that actually influence how we see the tweets. That's that's kind of the impression I'm getting. Although we do get the ML models, and then but again the issue with the, with understanding the ML models, you know, if your goal is to understand like why are you seeing this 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 tweet or that that tweet, one of the things you'd ultimately like to know is like what is the like what's the what's the training data, um, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So you get you'll get some of that um, from the stuff that we're getting, but I think there's a sense in which like, um, there's a sense in, in which you may ultimately not ever have a sense of like why you see a particular tweet, um, given the given the information we have, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So here's a social context filter. This looks like it has some implementation stuff. So, all right, so um, let's see, uh, apply has uh, likes by social context. Okay, so has liked by social context. It's gonna take some candidate features and it's just gonna call get or else on SGS valid liked by users IDs feature. Okay, so again, we're just essentially calling something by, by feature name. All right, so I'm gonna, let me just try grepping for, for one of these features in the code base that I have downloaded. Okay, so we get some like get or else stuff. We can we see imports. 
get or else, get or else. Um, I'm not sure that I see anything that, that looks like a definition. Maybe home features. Yeah, we see that it extends some stuff. Okay. Uh, maybe it's in the ML, oops, ML repository. Let's try that. What is it? The algorithm.ml. And I should not have the trail and comma. So it doesn't, I mean, maybe maybe it's not here, but again, um, as we've seen many times, GitHub search is, is really limited. So just for the sake of completeness, let's let's clone the code um, and do a, do a local grab. Yeah, okay. So it seems, it does, does seem like, um, and you know, if somebody knows more about the, the code, correct me if I'm wrong, it does seem like, um, the the features uh, are not are not things that we get to see. Um, okay. Reject tweet from viewer filter. Is authored by viewer. I mean this this seems like you know candidate detail is authored by viewer query candidate features. Uh, I guess this will tell us whether something is authored by the by the viewer. But we can at least, I guess, let's, let's take a quick look at what the filters are. So drop max candidates. Um, something about dropping <laughs> max candidates. Uh, feedback fatigue. Did we look at this? Yeah, let's look at feedback fatigue. Um, but what else is there? Invalid conversation module. Keep best out of network tweet per author filter. Out of network competitor. What's a competitor? URL. Is out of network uh, from competitor, competitor authors. I don't know what a competitor is supposed to be. Candidates partition is out of network to from competitor. Competitor authors set long uh, in network uh, author ID exists. Competitor authors. Hmm. Can you find competitor authors? Just this. Competitor accounts fetcher. Competitor list accounts. The competitor list store, we somehow store competitors. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like we might be able to find out something about competitors, but um, it, other searches haven't been fruitful, and I'm not I'm not going to go down this particular rabbit hole. But if you're interested, there there might be something there that we can figure out how they what they think a competitor is. Um, but also, okay, so predicate filters going to apply some predicate predicate gated. I don't know, I don't know what gated means, but some I guess refinement of a predicate filter. Previous seen tweets, so things that we've seen pre previous previously. Uh, previously served ancestors. Maybe this is like the timeline, the um, threaded stuff. Is ancestor candidate feature, persistence entries feature. Don't know what an ancestor is, but maybe this is like a tweet that is an ancestor of a, of a tweet that's relevant. And so uh, they're going to show them together. Um, previously served tweets filter, reject tweets from viewer filter. I don't know what a viewer is. Am, am I the viewer? Retweet duplication. I guess don't show uh, a bunch of retweets of the same thing. Retweet source tweet removing filter and social context filter. Did we look at social context? I think we did. Uh, so candidates filter candidate, um, get or else in network. So if it's in network or has liked by social context, 
or has followed by social context. So, so uh, I guess um, maybe social context is, is like people I know, um, or has been followed by people I know, or has topic social context. I guess its topic is related to, to people I know. Um, candidate features get or else conversation module focal tweet ID feature none is defined. Um, so, so these are the things that, that enter the filter. So essentially like, um, this is maybe some of the social proof stuff has liked by social context is, um, get or else SGS valid liked by social. Okay. So this seems to be some of the social proof stuff. This is the social context filter. Um, and then, uh, what was this filter? This was the feedback fatigue thing. So let's see what, what feedback fatigue is. So we have feedback history feature. We're going to try to get the feedback history. Um, and then uh, filter on an entry. We're going to take a look at time since feedback by doing some query. Um, and then uh, we're going to set feedback type to tls.feedback type c fewer and group by engagement type. So maybe this seem, um, mm -hmm. I guess if we say we don't like something, then we're going to see how recently maybe we said that we didn't like it. And if the, the time since feedback is less than the duration for filtering. So we somehow know, um, you know, if I say I don't like cats, then, you know, maybe I'll check and like 30 minutes later, it will not apply as much. But at least during whatever, some time, like after I've said I don't like it, it's going to maybe tell me that that I should see fewer of them. And we're going to group by engagement type. And we've got some things like authors to filter and likers to filter and followers to filter and retweeters to filter. And I guess this, you know, maybe I don't like this author or I don't know what a liker is. Maybe I don't like these retweeters. Okay, and then we've got original author ID, author ID, likers, eligible likers, and eligible followers. All right. And then ultimately we're gonna return a bunch of stuff. Okay, so there is there is some information here, um, at least for some of these, some of these features that are kind of built up on, what is SGS? Something, something service. Oops, this one SGS. SGS follow graph data provider. Using SGS's get follow, or, so it's some service, uh, follow graph stuff. Must call SGS, social proof enforced candidate. Um, probably social graph stuff, social graph service. Okay. And then um, let's look at the, um, the visibility. This is what I wanted. So, uh, support legal compliance, improve product quality, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at source main. Visibility. Maybe this isn't what I wanted. Engine builder interfaces, generators, models, rules. Feature. The community tweet, content ID, media safe label type, misinformation policy, muted keyword, safety label, safety label metadata, safety la label type, I guess. Safety label, safety label group, semantic core annotation. Yeah, I guess so. Base safety label type, tweet, delete reason, tweet, model metadata, tweet, model metadata, tweet, safety label, user age, user label, sensitive media settings, a unavailable state enum, your context and violation oh, violation level. Okay, so some of these might be interesting. All right, media safety label type.
media safety label type. Um, okay. We're going to get something from thrift. Am I missing a bunch of thrift models? Maybe if active labels, uh, we're going to, is we're going to filter labels if they're not unknown or deprecated. Here's thrift to model map and we get a bunch of labels. Okay. So reserved, uh, so these are, um, deprecated values, I guess. Um, not safe for work, high precision. So I guess the, whatever detects not safe for, for work, um, uh, images or, or text or whatever, high precision, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's different from high confidence, but, but maybe the, the, the precision is also higher in addition to the confidence or, or separately from the confidence. High recall. I don't know. Maybe that means like cast near, not safe for work, near perfect. Not safe for a card image. I don't know what card image is. is. PDNA, no idea. PDNA, no treatment and verified. Also no idea. DC, DMCA should be like a um, copyright takedown request. Legal demands withheld. Um, so I guess there's been some legal demand. I don't know what withheld means, but, but maybe um, like the context, you know, the context of the of the legal demand is is what's being withheld. I don't know. Local law is withheld, so there's some local law. So um, I'm not sure what this might be, but this might include things like you know, if Twitter runs in an area where like um, you're not allowed to talk about being gay. That <laughs> this might be why why how the mechanism by which those tweets are um, you know removed or or reduced in visibility or or whatever. Um, I don't know if if Twitter do, does that or where they operate, but, um, some local law, uh, that can be used to, 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 um, influence the safety label, I guess, or, or influence the safety uh, rating or whatever. Um, and here's just some like, uh, marshalling of labels to Scala types or whatever and some more uh, of the same stuff. Okay. So what else do we have? We have misinformation policy. Uh -huh. So, okay. So semantic core annotations priority. So we get some priority for things like misinformation policy. Presumably all this stuff has priority. A filtering level, which is an int. Okay. I don't know how that's different from priority, but maybe uh, some other, you know, parameterization of, of filtering. Publish date engagement nudge, which is a Boolean. Uh, and it is set to default engagement nudge. I don't know. Maybe nudge means like, you know, do we nudge the tweet down instead of uh, removing it or whatever? Suppress autoplay. I guess you can suppress autoplay if things are, are, are misinformation. Maybe a warning that can be displayed, a details URI. So if you have, maybe if it's like a certain kind of known information and it's like, you know, this is information about cats. If you want to learn more about cats, go to factsaboutcats.com or whatever. Um, a display type, applicable countries, and fleets inter fleet interstitial. I have no idea what fleet interstitial is, um, but I guess applicable applicable countries. So um, misinformation, I guess, can be configured by by country. I don't know if that's because um, you know some information might only be relevant in, in a country. So like you know maybe. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about the, the Canadian maple syrup industry and that only needs to, to apply in Canada. Um, or, or maybe, or maybe it means that, um, you know, maybe some, some local law requires misinformation to be labeled, um, but other countries don't. And maybe we make different decisions about that based on, based on those laws or something like that. But uh, presumably applicable countries means these are the countries where, will uh, apply this filter or something along those lines, something similar to that. All right. Um, so the information display type, get the latest, stay informed, misleading, or government requested. <laughs> I, okay, government requested. Okay. And then I, no idea what fleet interstitial is. Okay, filter level and state. Cool. Draft, dog food, and published. I guess these are these are states like I guess dog food is maybe visible only to, to Twitter employees or whatever. Draft is who knows. 
Semantic core information. So do we get a list of, of, of misinformation? Apparently not here. What's a common mis like um maybe COVID? Let's try grep for uh COVID. We've got display location, tweet safety label scala. Let's try one of these files. Do I not have Scala mode? No. Okay, so we we do oh this looks big. Maybe the thing to do is to, to just open this file in 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 GitHub. So let's take this. I think visibility lib is part of this thing I just grabbed. Let's try this again. Let's go to main. And maybe just paste this in. And then tweet safety label. Okay, so here's some, some some safety label stuff. So we have abusive, abusive behavior, abusive behavior insults. Okay, so like I guess in like verbal insults, violent threat, major abuse, abusive high recall. I, I guess high recall is like a modifier on the on the classifier because that's similar to to what we saw in the other file. Ads manager deny list. I don't know what that is. Maybe um, some the ads manager. <laughs> let's say that. They don't want you to see something like if, you know, General Motors is, is like advertising and they don't, you know, and they think it's inappropriate to wear like white suits um, after Labor Day or something. They they won't they won't let you see tweets about that. I, I don't know. I don't know what that's supposed to be. Ads manager. Maybe ADS is, is some other abbreviation. Agatha spam. No idea. Probably not like Agatha Christie. So here's um, automation. I don't know what that could be. Automation, how you call. Bounce, bounce edits. Brand safety, uh, NSFA aggregate brand safety. Um, I don't know if this is like brands being able to like um, tweet safety. Is this like if like um, uh, people trying to like, um, you know, if you have like a beloved character for children, you don't want that character like saying bad words or whatever, maybe that sort of thing, like allowing brands to, to suppress tweets that are, um, uh, that like misuse their branding or something, perhaps bystander abusive, presumably something about like bystanders and abuse, copy pasta spam. <laughs> okay. Uh, do not amplify. I don't know what that is. Downrank, spam reply, duplicate content, duplicate mention, dynamic product add. No idea. EDI development only, experimental nudge for emergency use only, gore and violence of various precisions, hateful content, high crypto spam score. <laughs> so I guess this is people, um, presumably not people pr promoting cryptography, but maybe people promoting cryptocurrencies who are spamming Twitter. IPR reported tweet score. I don't know what PR is. Maybe public relations, maybe something else. High P spammy tweet score. Um, HP block score, proactive TOS score. Maybe proactive terms of service. If Twitter sees you doing something that, that seems like it might violate its terms of service. Um, 
spammy tweet content score, high toxicity score, high reported in mid high toxicity. Yeah, right. Interstitial development only, some development thing, IPI, live low quality, low quality, a misinfo civic, misinfo crisis, misinfo generic, misinfo medical. NSA, not safe for something, probably. Higher precision, not, it's not safe for work. Um, PNAG multimodal high precision. I don't know what that is. I still don't know what PDNA is. I'm reluctant to look it up live <laughs> on a live stream because I have no idea what it is. Um, recommendation low quality. RITO action tweet. I don't know what RITO is. RITO. Safety crisis. Why is safety crisis? Um, does this mean it's it's getting um, demoted or boosted? Or or maybe it means that um, it would be bad for safety in a crisis if, if this tweet were, were like seen by a lot of people. Then we have search blacklist, semantic core misinformation, smite spam tweet. I don't know what smite is. Oh, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to guess. So spam. Um, tombstone development only. Tweet contains hateful conduct, like slurs, I guess. Unsafe URL. Some more hateful conduct. Abusive Brazilian political Brazilian political tweets. I guess if you're Brazilian and you're... <laughs> oh, oh, deprecated. So we, we have a bunch of deprecated stuff. Experimental, experimental, experimental. Um, French election. COVID-19 vaccine. Brazilian election. Magic Rex deny. These are all deprecated. Okay. So what's up with Brazilian and French? So I guess um, in in the Philippines, <laughs> not safe for work. Near perfect. I think that means near perfect, um, like classification, as opposed to the image is near perfect. So persona non grata. I'm curious who that applies to. Um, PM uh, veracity nudge. PM is info deny list. Okay, so we've got a couple of of, of countries in here. We've got what was it Brazil, Philippines, U.S. election. The U.S. is in here. A bunch of elections. How many elections do we have? Um, we get four matches. Do we have, um, what else is in the news? Russia? No. Do we have Ukraine? No. All right. A little curiosity. Let's see if we have other election stuff. No. Crap, right? Let's try this again. Uh, yeah, I want to grab for election. So, okay, so abuse policy, election interference. So there's some abuse policy about election interference. Um, actually, let's do this in Emacs. I think this is how I do it. Okay. Oh, I don't want um, selections. Yeah, okay, but but uh, let's try this. We're gonna grep for election and then grep V selection. And then grep election again. Okay. Election Explorer, WTF, election candidates, election accounts. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff. Just out of curiosity, let's see if uh, some of the some of the controversial um, other countries, like uh, Russia, the language, Ukraine.
public interest rules, space safety, Ukraine crisis topic, and the Ukrainian language, Ukraine crisis in misinformation. Let's look at this one. Okay. So what is it? How is this different? So this is public interest rules. Um, so what else we have? Abuse policy, episodic. Encourage self-harm. Encourage hateful content. Gratuitous gore. Uh, glorification of violence. I don't know how this. Uh, okay, so this is abuse as a abuse as opposed to um, what was the other one? It was more like um, this is visibility. So maybe abuse is like you're going to get in trouble. I don't know what makes this abuse. So public interest rules. Where are we anyway? So um, we're in visibility lib again. Uh, so this is still part of visibility. Um, and, it's, and it's part of rules. But there's some policies. So these are all policy violations. Um, encourage mob harassment. Okay. Something about deceased users, private information, right to privacy, threat to expose, violent sexual conduct, threats, hateful conduct, threat or bounty, threat or, I guess, like offering <laughs> offering money to harm somebody, one off. One off seems seems like a pretty big loophole. <laughs> you can just, um, I guess it's like a catch-all um, for abuse, which uh, seems like it makes sense that you might need that. You know, it might be the case that you basically have what's in what is in spirit in a noom, even though in reality it's a map. Um, and in in an noom, you need often need a catch-all. So I, I guess that's probably what one off is. Um, and so it does seem like you, you might have it a, a situation where, you know, it wasn't covered by enums you've already thought of. Um, but it also seems like, you know, if I want to, you know, my friend, uh, whoever Chuck is, uh, I want him to stop, stop talking about something, you know, that's embarrassing. And I worked at, at Twitter, this would be maybe the, the way to do that. So maybe they, maybe they like log one offs. And, and 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 look at them. Maybe they log all of this stuff, I guess, and double check to make sure that it, that it was applied appropriately. Um, policy election interference. So we saw a couple of um, election labels: um, hacked uh, uh, misinformation voting, hacked materials, scam, platform manipulation, misinformation, civic abuse policy, Ukraine crisis inf misinformation, misinformation generic. And misinformation medical. What I don't understand though is why why is Ukraine here and not with the other stuff? Um it seems like Ukraine is kind of being special cased. Um because all of the other country specific stuff is in the other. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, but um, you know, if you spend some time with these files, maybe you'll figure out. Um, better than I will, what the difference between the tweet safety label is and what, what the abuse stuff is. Maybe the, the tweet safety label is like a label that's attached to the to the tweet. And um, who knows? All right, so we also have muted keywords, which I guess they're not going to tell us what they are. And I don't think I would read them live. Um, and then we have some more. So here's like a safety label implementation. So let's see if it's going to attach to a tweet. So we're going to get a score. Applicable users, uh, source, I guess the label source, model metadata created at applicable country. So I guess this this kind of depends on the country as well. Or we can, I guess, convert it to thrift, safety label with type. Yeah, all right. I don't know. I don't know uh, how, it, how it applies, um, but it does seem to be like something you could apply to users. Or, or might be country specific. Uh, safety label type, deprecated, unknown, strato only, label and noon value. Here's safety level. Ads business setting, ads campaign. So, so a bunch of the safety stuff seems to be ad related. I guess that's not so surprising um, since that that is ultimately how they um, how they are judged as a business. So they want to be 
favorable to, to advertisers, I suppose. Um, internal promoted content appeals. Article 2000, base, quig, whatever that is. Bird watch, card polling. Where are we? Safety level. You, uh, DES. I don't know what DES is. Direct messages, edit history timeline, follower connections, filter default, humanization nudge, GraphQL default. I have no idea what connects all these, <laughs> connects all of these things. Magic Rex. All right, minimal nearby time notifications, replies grouping, signals reduction, timeline content. I, I don't know why these are all considered safety levels. Um, maybe levels is not right. Maybe these are like safety contexts or whatever um, that are relevant for understanding the safety annotations or safety determinations. This seems to be a bunch of the same stuff. Safety level groups, um, semantic core annotation and space safety label type. DMCA. So this is a bunch of, I think we're um, kind of uh, getting back to some of the same. So I think I'm going to close all of these out unless I see something like super interesting. And then um, I'll call that a day. User age is GTE. So I guess is greater than or equal to. So I guess we'll just see how old the, the, the users are because there's a, often rules about um, young users have special rules, at least in the United States, probably in other countries as well. This list seems to be basically the same thing as before. This is user label stuff. User sensitive media settings. Viewer context. Violation level. We have level three, level four. So there's uh, four levels of, uh, I guess, uh, five levels of violation, including the default. Here's rules, but I think we saw the interesting things about rules. There's maybe downranking. Let's take a quick look at downranking. Toxicity score above downrank high quality section. Okay, a bunch of stuff. All right. Visibility library. So this this stuff I think is probably interesting, but um, I'm basically out of time. So I'll leave that there. So that that's an initial look at the at the um, at the Twitter recommendation algorithm. Um, the stuff about machine learning, I think, is is interesting um, on its own. If you're interested in, in machine learning, it's probably worth reading like some of their code, like the the PyTorch and the TensorFlow. Um, if nothing else, that will tell you uh, what like a big company like Twitter that deals with lots and lots of data, how they write their models. That's interesting on its own from a from a technical perspective. And then there's like the the context of the source code release was was something about transparency. And presumably the the background context and, and and you know the context under which Twitter changed leadership um, had to do with kind of debates about things like free speech, like what are you allowed to say on the internet and those sorts of things, and um, and so I thought it was worthwhile trying to just look at um, some of the some of the 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 ways in which they might like downrank a, a tweet. Um, Based on you know how they perceived like a like a safety violation and um, almost all of it was was totally expected. I was a little bit surprised to see the the country specific election stuff, but on the other hand, if there's like some, um, you know you know corporations are are among other things legal entities, and so for example, if you are an American corporation and the <laughs> the government tells you like you know there's a there, there's a there's a targeted campaign about such and such an election, that might be one reason why those things show up, or maybe there's just public pressure to do something about some particular uh, some some particular topic where just users or advertisers perceive that there is some sort of manipulation. Um, and so it's interesting to see um, how, you know, how that works. From a technical perspective, that sort of stuff is not super interesting. It's basically enums, and we're going to take those enums and, and label things. Um, but from maybe like a from a policy perspective, if you're thinking in terms of like, um, you know, tech companies, startups are, are are a big part of our economy. They're a big part of our, our social fabric. I think I think from that perspective, um, that sort of stuff is is maybe some of the more interesting part of the of the code base as well. So, 
Um, did we learn anything? I have no idea. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it was fun. I had fun. Hopefully you had fun. Thanks for watching. Bye.